I am so excited for today's episode because we have a lifelong friend of mine. Well, I mean, maybe not technically, but I think we've been friends for about a decade now, which seems like quite a long time. <laughs> Charles, you are here. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. I know that sounds crazy to even think about. If it, if it has been a decade, that really <laughs> puts a lot of things into perspective. Right. I, I mean, I remember the moment we first met and I mean, my mom and I speak about it all the time. Charles was selling uh, an apartment of my mom's in the city, as I mentioned, I think almost a decade ago. And she was in the process of selecting a realtor who she wanted to work with. And your energy just immediately, as soon as you walk through the door, we both were like him. He's Is the it? one. And, and it has <laughs> not, you have not disappointed ever since. So I would love to begin the conversation as I always do by really just giving you the, the floor, the space to tell my audience a little bit more about who you are and kind of what's going on in your life right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I, you know, before we talked, just love the energy too, is that we just vibe. There's just a couple of people in the world, you know, I was actually talking about this. I just came back from Florida, which is where every New Yorker is going right now. But just the, the community aspect when I went for runs was just incredible. And that's something that you, you don't find too often in say a personal development space, unless it is a personal development space. So that's why we connected. Uh, that's not always been the case. You know, for me, it really started at 22. You know, I, I kind of went along, just was just the, the person that just didn't read books, had a victim mindset, was not into learning, was not into, you know, it was drinking too much. I was going out too much, just typical guy going all the way. And then it really hit me at 22 when all of my friends graduated and I didn't. And I remember that summer very vividly being extremely hot at York, Pennsylvania, where I went to school and I was by myself. It's not like one of those college towns where it's still thriving in the summer. This is dead. No one's around. I'm working at the West York diner, just going back and forth, 45 minutes to the house, to the diner, to school. And I just remember one day thinking, just like, how did I get here? <laughs> you know, like what, what path got me where my buddies are graduating from Wake Forest and Columbia and John Hopkins, and they're moving into Manhattan and getting, you know, $45,000, $50,000 salaries. And I'm walking out after eight hours, you know, just not getting tipped at this diner, $32 after an eight hour shift saying like, what, like what happened? You just start going over your life. And that was the start of just, you know, people say it happens in a moment. For me, it definitely happened in a moment. Sometimes it could take time, but then you just say enough is enough. So that was, that was like people from high school would say that I'm, I'm totally different, you know, from who I am now and how I was, because I just, uh, you know, I, I came off that I was, I was shiny, but deep inside, I wasn't. Mm. It's crazy because so many people I find are so quick to kind of fall victim to their circumstances. They believe that where they are in that present moment is where they have to be moving forward. But what I honor and respect so much about your journey is that you realize that our power lies in choice and the decision to do something about the stuff that we don't like. Yeah, yeah. I was actually listening to a podcast today on my run and it was just, his name is Andrew Huberman. He's, he's a scientist. He's, he goes way into things that are just way over my head, but I just, he's just a smart guy and he goes into things. And he actually said something that, he, he comes from a very practical sense. I, I come more also, you know, I go into the spiritual and things like that. But he said that essentially, everything up until this moment is a conglomeration of events that happen. You know, we have no control over just all of these things that, that happen. And on my run, I said, there's also something you want to strive to. So really the conglomeration I, I call say self, but with a lowercase, and then who you want to go to is self with a capital S. It's something that you're striving for. So though I didn't read any books, I was failing out of high school, it took me longer to graduate college, I was a total mess, I was a total disaster, that led me to a potential higher self, capital S, that I could strive for. And at that time, it was, it was anything, it was easy. 
You know, I, I could have just had one less beer and that was like an ideal self at that time. Yeah. But now when you go on the, a journey or say you're older, small incremental improvements really make a difference. And that's really where I'm at right now is like, how do I do small things in my life instead of major yeah. Well, it's Choices. because the small things, the small things become the big things. And, you know, that's the power of the compounding effect. No matter what it is you're trying to pursue, the only way to fail is to quit. And something I'm, I'm starting to find also is that you always have one of two choices when it comes to making a change. You can choose to do it from a place of um, inspiration where you are actually, you know, owning the decision that you're making or... On the contrary, it can come at a result of desperation where you get that diagnosis or, you know, that the, the news that that breaks your heart or, or directs your life in a different in a different way. Would you say for you at that point when you were 22 sitting at that diner, it was a desperation moment? Yeah, absolutely. And ironically enough is that when you go into that, like I would love to know some kind of perspective or some kind of percentage of people that just go into this happened to me and I have because literally in that moment I, I I literally looked at it as it was just two choices I said I can continue going down this trail and in my mind I said things happen to me um I I have no control over the circumstances about my grades which is ridiculous or that I was still at school or that I was working at a diner making 32 dollars in an eight-hour shift and then the other perspective, which was, I'm not fine with this. Like, I, I have something more to give. And it's funny because I know so many of my, say, friends or, say, sphere of influence, that something happened, a breakup, uh, job loss, especially now in COVID, uh, you know, obviously health-wise. And then it's like, do they then start eating greens or do they do it temporarily, you know, like a diet? You know, I'm just going to read this book. Like, Charles, give me a book. I'm like, there's no book. I'm not going to give you a book. There's no, there's no pot of gold. And it took me a while to figure that out. So I would say the harder thing is even to keep on it. You know, I, I would say 50% of the people make the choice to change, but how many people actually continue on it? That's yeah, the hard and that's part. the difference maker. Discipline, right? Because yeah. motivation is fleeting. It's something that comes to you in a moment and it can be gone rather quickly, especially when you're tired, hungover, whatever, you know, excuse may, may show up in that moment. Discipline is key. And that's why I think it's imperative to have a circle that supports you, whether it's your close friends and family members. And, and if you aren't, you know, fortunate enough to have people like that nearby, then maybe you go out and create some new friends that are going to inspire you to expand and evolve into that person that you know you're capable of being. Yeah, yeah. The, the the guy Joe DeSena, who started Spartan Race, said this, uh, and, and highly recommend his podcast. Uh, Joe DeSena is Spartan Up, I think that's the name of it. And he keeps on saying, "Is that put it on the calendar?" Like, so he does races, and his races are very very hard. And people come to me and they're like, "How?" So I do triathlons. So I need a race. Last year during 2020, it was tough because I had no races to look forward to. I need something. I need accountability. Because otherwise, your boy is not doing well. Like, I need that, that person that's in the office that's waiting for me to make phone calls for business in the morning. Or I need that race for me to eat well and wake up and not drink and continuously exercise when I, this morning, don't feel like doing an hour and a half on the bike into a 45-minute run. Nobody wants to do that. But woke up at 445 and got it done because I just, I, I don't want to. Like when anyone that's gone to a race and they haven't done well, or someone that did something, or even just was not prepared for a test or prepared for a presentation, the feeling of that is very visceral. It's like you leave the presentation or the race or a date and you're like, that went terrible. <laughs> like, and that was all on me. And you just don't ever want to feel that again. So for me, that's my accountability is that. I don't want to give a bad presentation, so I overprepare, but I need that presentation on my calendar. So Joe DeSent always says, sign up for that half marathon or 
do something that forces you to get going. Otherwise, it's someday I'll, as Brian Dracy says, someday I'll lose weight. Someday I'll, you know, ask that guy out or talk to that pretty girl or whatever it is for, for you. Yeah, right. And someday never comes. Never for many comes. People. <laughs> never comes. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to highlight too, though, in those moments where you feel like your discipline and motivation is lacking, that you don't always have to give 100%. You know, you can still show up to your workout and maybe it's only 10 minutes and still, uh, instead of an hour, but at least you can say to yourself that you showed up, that you did it because ultimately, you know, we're not ever really letting a ton of people down other than ourselves. It's like, we're going to disappoint ourselves more than, than yeah. anybody in the long run, because it's our life and we have to be fulfilled and satisfied and happy, you know, at the end of it. Yeah, it's, it's funny, as you say that, is that James Clear wrote this this book called Atomic Habits. It actually I love that might book. Be, I know, it's amazing. And it's actually probably at home. And I was, for anyone that's on audio, I was looking at the book shelf behind me. But I, he, he talks about it, he goes, just put on the shoes and that's it. Consistently put on the shoes. And then once you put on the shoes for 30 straight days, walk outside. Then when you do that for 30 straight days, and for me, that was such a revolution for me because I was like, I'm not hitting my personal best. It's, you know, my heart rate is too high or I'm not running as fast. And then I just literally went into just do it. Consistency yeah. is everything and consistency. And then the other thing is, as you just said, is that outcome you can't control the outcome. Sometimes it's raining, it's too hot. Your body's not feeling well, your, your, your shoes go untied or whatever, just show up, just show up. And oh God, that took me a decade to internalize because I'm always about the outcome. And then when it doesn't come my way, I get, you know, teed off and I'm like, yeah. hey, you showed up, you know, you have, you have no control over the outcome sometimes, most of the time. I can't tell you, I am a broken record when it comes to this message uh, as it relates to my coaching clients, because perfectionism constantly <laughs> gets in their way. They beat themselves up, you know, if they accidentally, you know, miss that one workout or have the ice cream after dinner, I say, give yourself some grace. Life is also meant to be lived, right? You have to find that balance between masculine and feminine, between working your freaking tail off and also like enjoying that time where you get to rest and restore there. There is a happy medium. And as my mom likes to say, everything, everything in moderation, but we know, we, we know when we could be doing more, when we could mm -hmm. be doing better. And, and it's up to us to, to rise to the occasion if we're up to the challenge. Yeah. And, and, oh man, I get DMs all the time asking like, how do I, and then it's filled in with something. It doesn't matter, you know, and it, it's, it's always a motivation thing, you know, like how do I lose weight? How do I get more money? How do I save more money? How do I get promoted? You know, it's something they, they, they want something. And I think you just hit it on the head is that when you, first of all, you, you have to, you have to know that you want something more. Okay. Because complacency or stagnation or, God, that like is my biggest fear. <laughs> it's just, I'll go out to parties in, uh, you know, like a birthday party or something that like that out in the suburbs or I'll visit someone and, and I look around and, or the Long Island Railroad and I just see this, this, this lethargy that has just crept in over the decades where there's nothing that they're excited about. And maybe they are, and maybe they're exhausted, but when you see train car after train car, as you're walking to get a seat, you're like, I don't, this, that's the scariest feeling to me is just decade after decade. So even having that small thing is amazing to even know, like a small thing, in other words, to look forward to, or that you can improve. Yeah. You know what, Charles, though, what, what frustrates me and, and maybe that's not necessarily the appropriate word, but people they want to change, right? They reach out to you. How do I do this? How do I do that? And then you provide them with an idea, with a solution, but they don't want to put in the work. They, they're looking for the, the magic pill, the quick fix, but that's not what it takes. I mean, walk into the gym, the guy with the six pack, unless it's like he was blessed, like 
popped popping out of the womb with that body, <laughs> he probably had to work really hard for it. You know, people, people see the end result. They see the overnight success, but what they don't see is the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into that effort each and every single day, especially the days when everybody else has already quit. It's delayed gratification. That's it. It's you're delaying the gratification of getting, you know, my office is right below or above uh, Foot Locker. And Foot Locker has every once in a while, I guess, a new shoe that comes out. So they put the barricades and I walk by these guys and it's mainly guys and it's 50 to 60 people. It's 8 a.m. on a Tuesday. And I'm thinking, what is going on? Like, this is crazy. Ironically enough, the place that I got my salad from, great guy who's a cashier there, and he had to rent a place because he had too many shoes. I'm like, dude, I, I, I've never heard a guy need to rent. He has to rent a place to put his Air Jordans or whatever it is. And I'm thinking in my head, I did the math right after that. I said, if he has to rent the place, say that's 100 shoes and they're $300. Do the math on that. You know, that's a lot of money that could be a down payment, that could be compounding in the stock market, that could be getting a personal coach, that could be hiring Stormy. <laughs> and I'm just thinking delayed gratification of not getting the shoe or for me, it's, you know, my, my biggest thing I would say would be delaying knowing in the future it's going to be better financially, you know, because... I don't have an apartment that I used to have, but then I noticed I would rather put that extra X amount of money into the business because I know in the future that it's actually returning an investment instead of paying my landlord an extra amount of money, making him wealthier. You know? yeah. So delayed gratification and you got to be ready, as you said, like the students got to be ready because you're the coach and, you know, I, how do you turn someone around that? might not be ready. Like, what do you say? That's a good question. It obviously boils down to the circumstance to, to the individual because it's always different. But what I find most often is, is mindset. It's the victim mentality. It's them refusing to believe that they are worthy or capable of doing, becoming, achieving more. And sometimes it boils down to releasing some things, relationships, yeah. behaviors, and that's not easy. That's not easy. You know, we cling to what's comfortable. We cling to what we know and growth. It's challenging. It forces you to literally become somebody else. And, and not everybody can handle that. You know, that's why I think there are so many people mindlessly riding the LIRR, the subway, because in a sense, it's, it's almost, it's, it's easier, but is it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny you, you brought up, uh, so I'm, I'm reading Jordan Peterson's newest book and he brings up there that you, and, and he's talking about relationships and he goes, you have to bring up the smallest, smallest things because you have to be on the same page because otherwise that compounds into eight months later that the dishes aren't done and there's an explosion and you're like over dishes. No, it was eight months of the draw was undone, the DVDs weren't in order, you, you left the TV on, or the door was unlocked, you didn't feed the dog, or, and it's just this compound thing that people even do inside. I, I'll give you an example is that my, my butt, the guy that I, I ride bikes with, he, he came up with two crazy stories, it happened twice, so he needs to be doing this release more often, is he had a roommate at the time that he was just so frustrated with over a year. And then one Friday, he had someone over, his roommate had somebody over and my buddy walks in and he just exploded. He goes, I want to go to bed and you're going to be partying until the end of the night. And he just, and his roommate was, had no idea that over a year, this was bottling up and exploded. This is the crazy thing. That Friday, so he weighed himself on, on Friday because he was looking to, to lose weight. On Friday, he lost eight pounds because he released the energy, the stored energy. And I'm getting the chills. He actually, uh, six months ago, he came to me and he said he just did the exact same thing. Unfortunately, is with another friend and he lost weight. So this is not only just, this is legit weight that is 
like energy that's getting stored that you can actually release. So imagine more than a year, a couple of years, a decade. So yeah, that, 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 that honestly, I probably would say was the hardest thing for me to do was incinerate the ego was get rid of the ego, which is really, really hard because your ego doesn't want to go anywhere. Your ego is oh. like, no, 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 dude. No, no, no. We've been running life and you, and we're going to try and keep on running life. Yeah. So I would say it's the going into the highest self capital S, but it's also releasing childhood or programming of school, the victim mindset. It, it took me years of real development to get rid of that. <laughs> yeah. I also think it boils down to as often as you can coming back to your why and regaining focus so that you have clarity and you maintain an alignment with, with what it is you want and where it is you are headed, right? Because so often we can get lost in, in, in the day, in, in the weeks, in the months that pass us by without actually getting you know, to, to the core of what do we actually want our, our life to be, our legacy to be once we leave here. And I don't think enough people take the time to actually sit and consider that. They just fall into, you know, the societal norms, go to high school, go to college, get the good job, get married, have the kids, all the things. And I'm not trying to discredit any of that because it can be crazy, beautiful, amazing in, in the best of ways. But that's not necessarily for everybody. And that's why I think more so than ever, it's important to really just be honest with yourself because when you are, then, then you will reap the, the benefits, the rewards tenfold and everybody else in your life will be better because of it. You know, when you're, when you're locked into your zone of genius and, and you're just emitting love and light, people will want to be around you. Like the whole game changes once you just decide to uh, step into, into your power, into your greatness. There's a lot of people that want to change a lot of people. <laughs> that's oh yeah. Really the world of that's why I really, I have no social media apps on my phone. If I post to Instagram, I redownload it, log in, post to my stories or post whatever. And then I just log off because I can go right down that rabbit hole of this person needs to change because I want them to change, even though they're a complete stranger and it showed up on my Instagram discovery page, or there's someone that wants the world to change. Meanwhile, their whole life is a mess. And ironically enough is that I went to see Tony Robbins in 2009. And it was obviously a big moment because I was a huge victim mindset. I was the, the poster child of the woe is me. I, I, was the victim mindset, uh, victim Olympics gold medalist, we'll say that. And ironically enough is that I came back, I bought all of his DVDs. I had Tony Robbins like, you know, in my bloodstream and I'm like, I'm changing. You know, you leave that, you're pounding your chest. My whole life is gonna be different. I'm gonna be a billionaire with a private jet. And then real life comes right into play. You're still in the same environment. You're still in the same apartment. You're still in the same job. You're still in the same body. You're still in the same mindset, blah, blah, blah. And what I noticed is that what I was trying to do was, was change my mom and dad on their eating habits. Nothing happened. I bought them all these things. And ironically enough is that five years later, it took me five years working on myself. And then my dad approached me. He goes, hey, he called me up one day and he goes, hey, dude. Uh, your mom and I, we, we took a, you know, walk along uh, Long Beach, then we had a salad and my jaw hit the ground because you hear about it said, be the change in the world. And it's like, oh, that's nice. That sounds like it could be on an, a magnet on my refrigerator. But once that happened, I said, you got to be the person. You're not going to change your spouse. They might not be ready. Not going to change your kids sometimes because they, not, they might not be ready or, but you can change yourself. And once you do that, it just starts to radiate out. You are so right. And I honestly just got the chills as you said that because my gosh, we, it all begins with us. It begins and ends with us. And we have a bigger impact on the people around us, on the energy around us more than we even realize. That's why it is imperative, you know, that as, as a collective, we start to raise the vibration to start to open our minds and hearts to seeing each other a little bit deeper 
you know, beyond all the divisiveness that, that this country and this world tries to, you know, burden us with. Yeah, I'd say the, the biggest thing, especially now, is just the complete lack of understanding I could be wrong, you know? Yeah. I, you know, I, you know, I'm 26 and I could be wrong. I, I'm not, I was probably talking about myself when I was 26, I'm 35 now. But when, uh, it was actually a great distinction is that all the great religions talk about this is that, you know, Buddhism, life is suffering. Christianity is that you're a sinner. Uh, you, you know, you have the Jewish guilt. You know, it's like all of these things. In other words, you're not coming from per perfection and you're just getting a little bit smarter. You're coming from, you're wrong. You're just getting a little less wrong. And it was actually written about in The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F by Mark Manson. Oh, you and, can swear on here. I don't give okay, a shit. Okay, I didn't know. You know <laughs> I don't give a fuck. <laughs> demonetized. <laughs> but he brings it up and I just, it was one of those moments you read it and you go, I, for 25 years of my life, went and said, I'm correct. And maybe I'll seek out information to make me more correct, but you know, I don't need to. And anyone that's telling me different, they're incorrect. And that is a complete fixed mindset that Carol Dweck talks about. And it's a victim mindset because you're saying that I am right and that everyone else is incorrect. And to be honest, now I actually come from curiosity, you know, when even as extreme as it is, I say, I wonder why they actually believe that, you know, is it their upbringing? Do they have personal experience? Are they being told this? Are they programmed this? Is it school? Is it society? Is it social media? Is it their friends? I come from a, that's interesting. And, you know, it took me 13 years to get there, but it has opened my eyes to just science about health about my money my mindset i'm way happier you know I, I even look at myself you know not to pat myself on the back but when you start aging you'll start seeing who's making the right decisions and who's not and it starts compounding as you said earlier is that you really start to see over the years who's taking care of the body their money their relationships yeah they might be in a relationship but is it a roommate you know you know i yeah i i would say coming from a position of of I'm potentially incorrect. How is this person going to make my life either better or maybe they are wrong? But I'm open to hearing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I personally like to pride myself on being super humble. You know, I have humility. If I'm wrong, prove it. Tell me, and and I'll and I'll adjust my sales. I don't have to be right, but there are certain things that I do believe to be truth based on you know the feeling that I get to my core. And of course, you know, the research that I do, the, the effort that I put into learning about certain things, but we're always going to be students. As you mentioned, I mean, I'm only 28 years old, so I can't know it all. And I will, I will never claim to, but it is important that we all start to do a better job of inviting that sense of wonder. Tell me a little bit more about why you feel that way instead of getting so defensive, you know? That's, that's what is heartbreaking to me, that there are still some people that are so uh, paralyzed by fear or, or brainwashed, if you want to go to that extreme, that they are not even able to have a compassionate conversation. And, and that's troublesome because yeah. if we don't have that, we don't have anything. They are definitely, brainwashed is the right word. It's not, there is no wonder and, and it's like, that's two different words. There's, there's no wonderment. There's no curiosity. And, and just, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was on a show in the other day and I was with the buyer and we walked up to this building and she's looking at me, obviously through the mask, just my eyes. And she's like, what are you looking at? I was like, look how beautiful this building is. I'm like, this is amazing. I'm like this, look at the brick, the brickwork. And then over there you have a Juliet balcony. You're going to have Romeo come out and, and serenade for his Juliet or I might have gotten those orals wrong. I don't know. But just I looked up and I just said, it's just a it's an awe. Or there's this this place down in Greenwich Village on Ninth Avenue during Christmas is that all of the townhouses have said, we're gonna put out wreaths and and Christmas lights, even if we're not Christian, and just they celebrate it and it's stunning going down you, the trees and everything else. And ironically enough, is that I've been listening to a lot of these guys say, um, uh, 
Robert Greene, who wrote 48 Laws of Power, he just did a podcast. And then this this other guy who, they, they were like the, the, the bulls in China shop in the 70s. In other words, when they were going, you know, the, 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 the sexual revolution, the, the free speech revolution, in other words, they're pushing against the dogma. And it was an amazing moment. And ironically enough is that I've been listening to those people who would be old people in quotes. And ironically enough is they come from this wonderment now of like, how were the people when I was their age in the seventies, not coming from the same just excitement of the world. They're young, they're vibrant. Uh, and I know they want to make a big difference, but there's no listening. It's only just, just an outward expression online in the comment sections you know i got a dm recently where this guy just completely personally attacked riddled me with curse words and i'm like no guy should be having an outburst at a stranger like that imagine walking down the street and you you, you know he's got a shirt on about his latest instagram post and you walk up to him and, and say that like that would never happen but in the online in- environment that's why i know myself i have to just limit my limit myself otherwise you know i'm not gonna comment but i you know it starts going around in the head like well, everyone should be like me <laughs> kind of mindset i used to engage i used to engage and and i still do if people can meet me in the middle and have a compassionate open-minded conversation but when they come guns a already you know belittling me my character integrity or or anything to that regard especially when they're a stranger, a keyboard knucklehead, as I like to call them. Like, <laughs> I don't have, I don't have time for you. I don't have energy for you. What I've learned is that we need to continue to extend love, compassion, empathy, forgiveness to these people that have that anger, animosity, uh, because as we know, hurt people, hurt people. And clearly there's a lot of hate going on for whatever reason that he is so, you know, fueled to, to, to to passionately write, write whatever he might have wrote. I mean, God only knows. <laughs> yeah, every every night, it's funny. I, I took this practice on is that every night I, I um, put down my cell phone about an hour before bed because the blue light and, you know, just science tells me don't do that. <laughs> so I put down my cell phone, no blue lights. And I, I put on this great, very instrumental song that calms me down and it gets me ready to sleep. And I actually sit in, it's known as the hero's pose. I think it's Greek and Roman. And I don't know what it would be in yoga, but it'd probably have a different name in yoga. And I actually breathe through my heart and it's, it, it does wonders for me. I like, I breathe, like when I take in deep breaths, my thoughts go away. My, what happened for the day when it goes away. And that silence I feel is necessary in everyone's life. You know, say a hundred years ago, that was religion. You go to church or the tour, uh, you know, the temple or wherever you go and you had silence at least for an hour or, you know, obviously no cell phones. And then you spend time together. So for me is that I need silence. I, I feel everyone needs silence to just de stimulate the brain. And through me, It's at that time where I stretch, get my muscles ready for the next day, but also calm it down and then breathe through the heart. And like this guy that DM me, I would send him love, as you said, you know, before it felt weird to do it, but now I actually wish the best. I really do. I wish the best on him to find that whatever it is in the future that says, you know what, listen, I want to go down a path of change whatever that is for them, whatever journey it is for them. It sounds corny, but it, it relieves me of it. You know, I, I'll, I'll just leave you with this is that uh, Michael A. Singer wrote Untethered Soul, which is I, the greatest book ever. I personally One think it is. And it, yeah, it's just unbelievable. And he talks about it. He goes like, essentially what you're doing is just building up a house that's beautiful and then putting up all this stuff on your windows and it gets darker and darker. And you just keep on putting more and more boards on the windows. And then at one time, you can't even see the light. And that was me for a while. So when you start taking those things down and you start breathing out and sitting in silence and sitting in compassion, more light comes in. And as woo-woo as it sounds, 
I could see it on my resting heart rate compared to last year, which was obviously a stressful year compared to this year. So I could see it in the data. I also feel it. I just walk around with just a, you know, I can't believe we're alive kind of, kind of feeling a lot. Yeah. Something I want to highlight especially to those that are listening that may be kind of resistant to a meditation practice is that it doesn't have to be this formal thing, you know, find what works for you. As you mentioned, you have that one track that kind of lullabies you into a sense of calm. You know, I love, uh, on YouTube, I just Google or I like search singing bowls, Tibetan singing bowls or sound bath. Cause I, mm. I vibe more with that than kind of a guided meditation to each their own, of course, but yeah, it's, it's needed. It's needed just to get that, that clarity. And I know, I know I mentioned that earlier, but clarity is, is really significant when it comes to finding contentment within because a confused mind leads to overwhelm. And we want to try to strive towards something that's a little bit more peaceful to the best of, to the best of our ability. Yeah. You know, it's the amount of chaos that is trying to, to, to be pushed into the world of, you know, hookup culture or consumerism, or you could do whatever you want. You could eat whatever you want. And I, and I'm thinking, no, there's, there's, there's games in everything. If I, if I don't make sales calls, I'm not going to have any business. Like I can't just sit at work and expect things to happen. So each area has a game that I play. So my meditation, and by the way, it could be, it could be journaling. It could be meditation. It could be silence. It could be a walk. It could be stretching for me. A lot of the times it's exercise because my mind just turns off and I'm just, you know, into a run or into a podcast, but there has to be some area that, you know, you kind of move into, but to go on to that is that you have to put up boundaries, boundaries in my life. Otherwise I'm a mess. I'm an absolute disaster. I'm, I'm, I'm closing down the bar and then I'm going to the pizza shop. And that was like my life in my early twenties. And that's chaos. I was that left only just clogged arteries, broke, lost, no direction. So to fight the tyranny of chaos, you got to put a boundaries. You know, I'll, I'll give you this example. As I remember my buddy, he told me that he doesn't go on a date past, or he doesn't start, he doesn't start a date past seven because he knows it's probably going to, if it starts at eight or nine, it's going to go to 10 and 11, and then it's going to go into a sleep and then it's going to affect his exercise, which he won't do the next morning. And then he's going to show up as a, a sloth at work. And he goes, my entire day starts the night before. And it starts actually at that boundary of saying, hey, listen, if you can't do before seven, let's do it a Saturday or let's do it a Friday. And that changed my whole mindset. I'm like, I got to put up some boundaries in my life. Yeah. Well, everything has an, has an opportunity cost, right? When you're saying yes yeah. to something, you're saying no to something else. So it boils down to really prioritizing what is most important to you and then obviously making decisions in alignment with, with what you land on when you, when you take that into consideration. I kind of, oh. oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say for me is I need accountability for that. So, you know, they talk about it in, uh, atomic habits, but some kind of accountability, it could be a coach for me. It's, I have a coach for triathlons, but I, I need accountability or else I'm not going to show up. That could be someone that walks with you in the morning someone that rides with you and you carpool to work and you're listening to a podcast or accountability at work you like for or accountability accountability online where you post on social media and say hey listen hold me accountable i had a buddy write me a check for $500 and he said cash it and if i don't do this then i'm not going to get it back so i would say accountability is for most people is one of the major things to just just get that that ball rolling at yeah, well, <laughs> I, you know, I'm a huge fan of that. I mean, my entire business is based off <laughs> accountability. So I, know. I could talk about that probably for four years, but I did want to kind of circle back to post diner. You're now doing all the things you're reading. You are committed to, you know, up leveling. What did your look like, you know, 25 onward to get you where you are now, which is obviously a really successful, awesome place to be. Yeah, I would say there's been three very large turning points, like 
catastrophically large. So, and they were in three totally different areas of my life. So the first one was my mindset, which was in college at 22 years old. Then two years later, it was as a relationship. And obviously today is you're seeing it more and more is that people are getting older and more single. And I'm 35. I look around and there's probably been no more single 30 year olds or 40 year olds now than ever in history. And I feel a, a portion of that, you know, so this is what happened. I was leaving brother Jimmy's and oh, yeah. <laughs> everyone's favorite, actually where we, you know, we, we were at one of the Sunday football games. Bro Jay's Thursdays, <laughs> Bro Jay's, my favorite. You know, they know me uh, quite well in the twenties. And I, I remember this, this time I was, I was talking to this girl and this guy kind of walks over and then she looks at him and then he enters the conversation. And then, you know, we're, one word bars another, she end up ends up walking away. And I remember thinking, like looking at them, I'm like, I just had an hour conversation and within two minutes, three minutes, she just walks away. So I had a mentor at the time and we went out to lunch the next day and I brought that story up and he said something that was, that was very profound. And he, I told him the situation and he just looked at me stone cold, not nodding, not going along. And I go, what is going through your head? And he said, okay, so you're looking at this guy last night. I said, yes. And he goes, okay, uh, was he dressed well? I said, yes. Best, best, better dressed than you? I said, yeah. He goes, was he tall? I said, yes. Was he handsome? Yes. Did he look like he was put together? I said, yes. He goes, does he look like he was older? Yes. Does he look like he had money? Yes. So in other words, he went down this whole criteria and he said, if she had a choice between a guy that lived on his own, who is established in his career, who's older, who's better dressed, who's confident and everything else, why would she choose you? And then it wasn't even about the relationship. It was more like, what am I bringing to the health game? Like, what am I bringing to the conversation with a girl? You know, like, why, why would she choose me? There is no reason that she should choose a 23-year-old lost, drinking too much, eating too much me, or a 30-year-old lives on his own, has his shit together, works at Goldman Sachs. Like, that's it's no brainer. Yeah. So I just took that into every area of my life. I said, I just literally looked at every area. I started with my money. I started with my health and I just, I, I had to incinerate things, you know, with, with, uh, health, you know, I'm Irish. So it's potatoes and meat. My mom would say, drink a glass of milk, you know? And then over time, I just started saying like, too much meat is, is not that good. And obviously I'm not giving any preferences, do your own thing or too many carbs or milk has, you know, it, you know, I won't go into it, but for me, my ideal choice is a plant-based lectin-free diet with lots of water. With money, it was stop spending your shit on $1,200 suits, $400 dinners and pretending you're the man when just waited out. And I just went through every area of my life and I just was honest. And, and that's, that was the ego that I was talking about before is that your ego gets in the way and says, nah, you're good, you're good. Cause change it was so hard at that time because you, you're saying my mom who raised me and nothing against my mom because my mom, you know but say milk or the traditional cereal choices of, of having Flintstones, sugary, just isn't good in the morning to get you excited. It spikes your blood sugar and then, and then you crash maybe at 10 or 11. So I was like, all right, let's try something else. Let's try oatmeal, let's try. So that was many years to go down and I, and I took a theme a year. So one year it would be my money, learn about money. And at that time I had insecurities that, because I lived in, an area in, in Long Island called East Williston. I was surrounded by very wealthy people. You know, we would go to bar and bat mitzvahs where they would, they would rent out the entire Madison Square Garden or they would do just these overlandish sweet 16s. And I didn't, it's not like I was a pauper, but I'm looking at this and I was thinking, I, I had this insecurity that I, I wanted to impress those people that I wasn't able to impress. So when I started making money, I was stupidly spending, you know, you see it a lot in California where they get a Maserati, but they live in a 100 square foot place. And for me, I said, 
I would rather have a 1,000 square foot place that I own and drive a Honda or a Hyundai than a $200,000 apartment. I'm um, sorry, $200,000 place. Put that 250,000 towards a down payment or pay cash. So it took me every single year of doing a theme and I do, and relationships as well. I you know I was a really nice guy, which is very manipulative. I can go ad nauseum on what's going on with the the relationship world, but I was I was that guy that was just malleable. Oh, she liked this, then I definitely like that. She liked this, then I liked that, and I had no personality, so I, I just was honest with myself. What do you like in you know? you know, in life. And if she doesn't like it, it's just not a, it's just a, a lack of chemistry. What did that process look like for you? You know, finding your truth in relationships or, you know, within yourself as it relates to relationships. You know, I had to be okay that I'm not right for everyone and everyone is not right for me. And that is tough because we want to be accepted we don't want to be rejected. We want people to like you and ourselves. And especially as a guy, you know, traditionally you do the initiating and a lot of guys don't want to initiate because they feel that every girl should say yes. And you're thinking, dude, you don't want every girl to say yes. You know, it's like, that's a lot of time. It's a lot of money. You're not going to be compatible. That's a lot of one dates. You want her to say no. So it's the same thing with business is that I don't want someone to bring me on, but there's a, a personality incompatibility. So in other words, I'm very outgoing and positive. I don't get along with people that are negative. Look at the, the downside of things. It's just, a, it just hurts to be in a transaction yeah. like that. So I had to ask three questions, which is what do I need to start to do in my life? What do I need to stop doing in my life? And what do I need to continue doing in my life? And it took me a weekend of no drinking food or anything. And it just, I, I just journaled for hours about like, what, how did I get here? Okay. That's my personality now. Where do I want to go in every area of my life? And then, yeah, just got to focus one thing a year because otherwise it's overwhelming. A lot of people see me and they're like, I want to do what you do. I'm like, dude. I'm 35, you're 22. It's not happening for a decade, things like that. So I, I would just look at the biggest thing that needs to change. A lot of people, it's health. A lot of people, it's relationships or, or I didn't say and, or it's your money. One of them, like getting out of debt or improving the relationship or improving your health. Those are the three biggest areas. And at that time for me, it was health. And I, I see that as the baseline. Like if my health is not right, I have no energy for work. I have no energy for a relationship. I'm not fun to be around. So I put that as, I, that's like my keystone. That's my yeah. bottom. It's my rock. It's foundational for sure. Oh, yeah. Can you potentially repeat those three questions again? Because I think that could be a fun little challenge takeaway for, for those that are listening to either kind of journal it out, or maybe if you're feeling inspired and you want that added level of accountability, you can even post to your stories and tag us so we know that you're actually getting it done. Uh, one of my favorite quotes actually from John Maxwell is the person that talks about all that he's going to do tomorrow probably did the same thing yesterday. Mm right? Because we can talk and talk and talk and dream about all the things that we want to do, but nothing's going to happen unless you actually step up and take action and do the damn thing. Again, whatever it might be, we all have different desires and, and, and outcomes that we are hoping to, you know, find from, from this life that we are living. So yeah, if you could just repeat those questions one more time, yeah. if you remember them. Yeah. So the, Oh, I definitely, I still do it today. I, okay. I, I, I do it quite often. I, I journal and I, ha I brain it's, I, I didn't think of the term, but I brain dump. I got to just, whatever comes out of my head, blue square, green window, yellow pants. And I just get it, whatever, like whatever the hell, I don't know where the hell that came from, but okay, it's going down on paper. And ironically enough is that I had a, to just go off of this is that 
what I do is I look at someone that has an area of life that I want, okay? And then I just say, like this one guy at the gym is an amazing father. So I would go over, I would befriend him over the course of time, you know, like, hey, dude, blah, 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 in the gym and everything else, get to know each other. And I say, hey, man, it seems like you really love your girls. Uh, like, what do you do? And he goes, listen, when I'm home or when I'm at dinner, I prioritize them. I don't do the plane trips. I don't do the trips with the boys or anything like that. So I take that into my brain. I also have uh, someone else that I look up to. Uh, he was actually a mentor as well. And his relationship with his wife is incredible. Okay. But by the way, the other, the other guy that I was talking about, his health is terrible. So it's not like I'm just going for what they are best at. And this other guy who made money, but his health also isn't good, but he said he never stopped dating his wife. 80% of his, his relationship with his wife is fixed. In other words, it gives her comfort and security because if it's all chaos, that's a lot of fighting and it's, it's, there's no security in that relationship. So 80% and then the 20% is the variability. It's the honey, let's go out on the town. I just got a babysitter, uh, you know, just left a note on the kitchen table, like small things. It doesn't have to be big, you know, just left the rose on the bedside and he goes that 20%. So when I look at a relationship, I just was in a relationship. I said, you know, like what was good about it? So the three questions in each area to go to your question is what do I need to start doing? So in other words, in, in my past relationship, it was bringing more variety. Okay, what do I need to stop doing, which is being consistent every single time. It's boring. No one wants to be in that relationship. There's no growth. It's all stagnation. It's going downhill. And what do I need to start doing? Or it was start, stop and continue. And what we were doing, ironically enough, in that relationship and why it was so well, we ended up on other reasons. But what we did was we, we communicated every single Sunday about things that might be bothering because she was she's in the medical field so she had off on Sunday Monday and every single Sunday we'd meet and be like okay how do we make the relationship better you know like what do we need to do you know do we need to go out more do we need to hang out with friends do we need to be by ourselves do we need to you know talk more intellectual you know what do we need to do but we met and I actually t I ripped that from someone else who said they met with their wife every single Sunday and they said, what are our trips this year? What's our plans? What's our budgeting? What's, wh what are our kids' goals? Uh, in other words, they already had kids, but like, what do they want to do? Are they playing soccer or volleyball? I think that's an incredible thing to do is just continuously take inventory. It's, it's hard. It, it's got to be consistent yeah. too. I think that's genius because first and foremost, men and women are completely different beasts. And I can imagine if you fall somewhere between there, it, it's a whole different beast. So uh, yeah, you know, on, on its own regard. So communication is everything, especially when you're able to do it in an open understanding way. And, you know, it takes a lot of the guesswork out. Like you mentioned, we, we can't always know what's going on in the other person's head. So being able to talk through all of the stuff that may be compounding before you eventually come to that breaking point. I can imagine that doing so salvages a ton of relationships and, and chaos along the way. And something I also like that you kind of pointed out was this whole notion of really just becoming a student of the game, right? Wherever it is you want to improve upon or excel, find somebody that already has it figured out, or maybe they haven't like reached the top, so to say, but there are a few paces ahead of you so that you can kind of streamline the process and take out a lot of the heaviness that may come to you along the way, you know, just, just commit to, to learning all that you can and putting your best foot forward because when you choose to do so, you, you can't fail or I would like yeah. to think so. <laughs> yeah. In the relationship, ironically enough, is that what I, what I saw in this relationship and what I noticed is that what I thought I wanted in a relationship was this very high driven woman that is that way in the relationship. Uh, this woman that I was dating is a doctor at a major hospital. She's extremely smart. She has three letter acronyms at the end of her name for miles. Uh, straight A, like brilliant. 
and runs the entire department. So she is the hashtags of all the boss babes. Yeah. But in the relationship, the dynamic fits me where she relies on where's the place, what's the time. And that makes me secure because it makes me feel masculine. So yeah. I never really had that style because I never showed up. So I would blame the, the girls that I dated. It wasn't them. It was me because I never created the environment of safety and security of, hey, listen, I got it. Don't worry about it. Just show up. I got, you know, things like that. So if there's any guys listening to this, that's number one is that create the safety and security for her to be herself in the relationship at work. Let her do whatever she wants and rise to the top in the relationship. It's it's different. The second thing what I noticed in the relationship was that I noticed the smallest things and I would bring it up immediately. If she double inhaled or she clenched my hand while we're talking or she moved and I would be like, what was that? And that was the spark to, to starting a conversation or to continuing what maybe was irked her. And that communication was vital because otherwise you build up resentment. So the smallest thing that you'll see in your partner, bring it up, be like, he scratched his eye, he, he played with his hair, he, whatever. The smallest body movement irked them in some way, bring it up. What was that? Why, why did you, and truly be open. You know, I think that was my biggest growth is that truly be open to the answer, whatever it is. It could hurt your feelings. That's fine. At least you know. Yeah. Well, it seems like staying open is a theme of this entire conversation. Yeah. We keep we keep coming back to it. Uh, so with that said, I do want to be mindful of your time. Uh, is there anything that we have not touched on? I know that you and I could probably be here for for years talking together um, that you just kind of want to leave leave listeners with any sort of, um, you know, actually, I'll just leave it at that. I would <laughs> say, I would, yeah, I would say health has to be people's priority. It has to be your priority because I see it all over the place of someone that had their way. They were, they were a collegiate athlete or they were a marathoner and then something happened. And ironically enough is that, you know, the, the number one excuse is time. I understand time. You know, the, the, I go to an Ironman event for a triathlon is that I see tons actually the majority are moms and fathers that squeeze it in right before they wake up the kids they go to work and it makes them feel better it's a great role model for their kids they also can play with their kids because they have the energy you have to prioritize health you cannot get promoted in this world without having energy you because it, it's also creative juices it's it's managing it's showing up early it's working later it's turning yourself off for the weekends it's also in your relationships because if you don't have energy and you just sit there and it's not a relationship it's a roommate you know you so it, and money doesn't flow to someone who's lethargic or, or things like that so i know it's hard during covid but what i'm seeing from a lot of the people that DM me or because, you know, I, I'm not in the personal development space where I like do seminars, but people that DM me, I just say, this didn't just start yesterday. So let's focus on the health and then the relationship will come because you feel better about your body. Okay. Yeah. You feel confident about wearing a suit or bikini or you know, no shirt or whatever it is. You just, it, it's, it's inextricable when you're, when you're showering and you come out, you feel better. Like you, you yeah. can't, you, you can't take any medication. It, it's, it's impossible. So I would prioritize health out. That that's the number one thing. And, and how do you start? I would start with uh, the plant paradox by Joe's uh, uh, right here by uh, Stephen Gundry. So the plant paraga, it's, it's a little thick, but it will bring just a little clarity to food because uh, big food is lying to us about sugar content and carbs and, and just, it's just an absolute disaster. 
what's oh, going yeah. on in the, in the food industry. We are being fooled. Another good one also is Food Fix by Dr. Mark Hyman. Yeah. If you haven't read that one yet. He's I awesome. Love him. I love the book, everything about it. I also wanted to just point out to those that are listening, Charles has the most epic display of books behind him. That's another reason why we totally vibe because as you know, I am a avid reader myself. So I just am soaking up. I'm like trying to figure out which ones I've read and which ones I haven't. And I'm trying to add them all to my list as, as we're speaking here. Screenshot. Uh, <laughs> seriously. All right. Well, I want to say thank you so much for your, your time, your energy, your wisdom and expertise. I know that you have a busy world to get back to in New York city. Uh, but before we do go, please tell everyone where, where can they find you if they're interested in learning more and following along with your journey? Yeah, I'd say the best place, though I just said I'm barely on it, would be Instagram. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on TikTok. I do have a YouTube channel where I do book reviews. So I would highly recommend you check that out. If you don't want to read the book, I'll give you the synopsis and I'll connect it with 20 other books that I read because it just starts making sense. So Instagram or on YouTube, my web server is down, but it is icharles.com. Ironically enough is that I, I see a lot of people that crave knowledge and they, they want the wisdom. So I think what you're doing and what Dr. Mark Hyman or any of these authors is pushing out even smaller pieces of content is necessary. It could be something small. I'll, I'll leave you with this is that there's someone that brought up nose breathing, just breathing yes. through your nose. Wait, breath, and the book. Yeah. Yeah. James I have it right yeah. here. He's awesome. I'm He's reading it. He's got a great personality. I just heard him on a podcast. I haven't read the book. I actually, I just got on Kindle. And he brought it up like months ago. I got to tell you, one of the biggest things that I have brought down my resting heart rate, when I'm running, I breathe through my nose. And if I have to breathe through my mouth, that means um, I'm running too hard. So it has changed everything. I walk, I'm, I'm calmer. I walk through the world with more vigor, with more uh, curiosity, with, with more calmness. By, I was a chronic, as they say, the chronic mouth breather. You know, I don't want to get into the science of the book because he explained some of it, but I, I would say that's a huge thing to implement into your life is, is breathe through your nose. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. Oh yeah. The breath. It's our life force energy. Without it, we I wouldn't know. be here. Got to start paying more attention to it. That's for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, it has been so much fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, giving us, giving us you. And I look forward to having you on the show again. And hopefully, you know, my people now get get a peek into all that you are and get to continue to follow along with all that you continue to do. I really appreciate it because this kind of content really helps not only myself, but anyone that's listening, especially on, on, on audible or on podcast, because you can go for a run and just hear the, the Sinatra like voice of stormy <laughs> going through that 30 minute workout. I appreciate workout. that. Yeah. yeah. No, there's nothing like it podcasting. I mean, for me too, especially uh, on the back end, you know, seeing, seeing the metrics, 200 people listening to my show, that means 200 people intentionally decided to put in their headphones or press play. You know, it's different than when you're mindlessly scrolling on social media, you see whatever podcasting, it's different. You have to choose to listen. So that's why I'm always so humbled by, you know, those that do choose to engage with me in this way. And, um, that's why I will always extend my gratitude to those that are willing and able to, to come on and, and spread everything that they have with inside, with inside them, because we have so much value each and every single one of us, even if we don't believe that we do. And I think that's a huge takeaway from this conversation as well. You know, you could have easily stayed that kid, you could still be working at the diner, but you chose differently. And I just want that to ring home, you know, for everybody that's still here, you have the power, you have the choice to make your life anything you want it to be, but you yeah, have to believe, yeah. and then you have to follow through. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you on this is that I was just down visiting my mom in Florida and 
she just loves when I come down because I'm a, I'm a total, I'm like a, you know, a bull in a china shop. I just start destroying things. But that's because, you know, I'm allowed to, you know, let the, let the proverbial hair down. But she said something very interesting that I never heard before. <clears throat> and she said, she said, uh, you know, you're a special, special human and you have a lot of gifts to give. And I, I, on the flight up, that really resonated with me because what I actually brought that to was that I created this person that she's seen, okay? So if we rewind and we fast forward a victim mindset who's visiting my mom in Florida, I doubt she, she would have said that because I wouldn't be in shape or as excited or as curious to explore the wilderness with her, do the hikes or get into a kayak or things like that. And, and that really resonated. So exactly what you just said is that at any time you could just literally flip the switch and start creating the relationship that you want, that you're already in, or that you want to get into the future, the wealth by pulling back your finances, investing more in your body, eat more greens, more water, whatever the case is, you can start at any time. And uh, thank God I did, because otherwise uh, we would not be on this podcast right now. Yeah. And you just <laughs> got to start. Work is, exactly. Done this better than perfect, messy action. Yeah. So with that, I think it's a nice place to end the conversation so that if you're still here, again, listening, go out and, and chase your dreams, get it done because you deserve everything that, that you are seeing in your heart and in your head. So until we meet again, bye-bye.